I, I somebody sent forwarded a link to this class to me and I was interested to find out how one goes about um, tackling big problems basically in this this class seemed like the the way to do that. So hi everybody. Oh, my name is Park. I think I missed the most important thing. <laughs> I was just about to ask you um, of how should we address it. I am just so delighted that you started with this introduction because I just want to reiterate this framework. You know, it doesn't really matter the field that you work in. Uh, the fact that you're thinking about access is just so fundamental to everything that we do. I mean, you know, there is also a sense of wonder that we all have to maintain in trying to tackle these uh, challenging problems. And, you know, there's nothing more wonderful than looking up at the sky in the night. Uh, there are two projects Absolutely. in the last uh, two years of frugal science that were all inspired by astronomy. One is, of course, the obvious scenario of how many people even have access to a telescope to enjoy the night sky. And so that team has been growing. Uh, and then, of course, the other one, which uh, uh, you might find really interesting, which uh, the team went very far, uh, are really in the context of thinking about cost-effective ways for space debris. Mm. Uh, that being such a huge issue. And, you know, of course, uh, although we think about launch costs, you can imagine for certain things, you can piggyback on other operations, but how would you? It's actually the non-trivial, it's an unsolved problem per se of how do you even think about space debris at large? And so there was a lot of uh, really fun uh, simulations and threads and sets of ideas of hyper-elastic materials of how do you absorb energy of these high traveling objects uh, in space? Uh, how do you really think about containment strategies? So I'm just, I'm speaking out loud here, but space is not the limit. Uh, and then finally, there's tons of technologies that are developed for space or were developed for space that have incredible applications in the challenges and fields that are here. So, you know, I think uh, it would actually be really fun to flip that around as well to ask what have we developed that's incredibly robust. I mean, I'm just always amazed. I don't know how many of you followed the Curiosity rover. You know, many of these robots can have tiny handheld mass specs. You can't even imagine thinking about an entire mass spec that you could do any kind of analysis uh, in a hospital setting. Uh, but of course, it's designed in a framework of space. And so many of those technologies as yet have not made back to planet Earth in some sense. Uh, uh, that was a wonderful introduction. Anybody else uh, who's online but hasn't had the chance to go? And then I'm assuming, uh, Park, you are on Discord. So please just uh, write a quick intro. This will be one way for people to contact uh, Uh, just raise your hand if you haven't had the chance. Otherwise, we're going to dive in into today's agenda. Uh, I think I wanted to open and start with uh, just a little bit of a brief discussion on the homework assignment, uh, back of the envelope calculations. Uh, I'm wondering if there is a volunteer who wants to just share what they're thinking about. You may have or may not have finished the homework. That's okay. Uh, but I'm curious if anybody wants to discuss it for a minute, uh, you know, maybe a couple minutes. And the idea here would be is to see if there are places that you got stuck. And, you know, ideally, at some point in time, you should get stuck, otherwise you're not pushing yourself. Uh, but anybody uh, online or in the room wants to? Uh, yeah. Uh, I could. Okay, I think uh, I'm... Why don't people raise hands for the folks who might want to discuss the homework, and then I'll keep an eye on that. And then we'll spend a little bit of a few minutes trying to decipher and go through a few examples, because I think I just want you to see and get a sense for, oh, did I go far enough or not? Okay. Um, yeah, so I was curious about the distribution of uh, farmland ownership in India, and specifically uh, the farmland that undergoes double burning, um, because... The idea being if there's a few farmers who own the majority of the land, then maybe you could convince a small number of people to adopt more sustainable technologies. And then that might be cheaper than going to individual farmers who own like small plots of land. Mm -hmm. um, and the first problem I ran into was 
it seems like there's not even a good estimate on how much land is burned. Uh, so people try to use satellite imagery, but that can be fraught because there's a lot of different issues with like the smoke occluding a lot of the information. Um, and then beyond that, it seemed like the census, last census on farmland was in 2011. So a lot of the data seemed to be outdated. Um, so I tried to apply some of that 2011 information to uh, like satellite imagery data, and then also uh, distribution of land ownership in the United States and other countries and try to see if I could approximate. Uh, and I think maybe about 30% of the land is owned by 5% of the farmers, um, but it's still unclear to me whether or not those 30% of farmers, since they're larger uh, groups, they might have already adopted sustainable farming methods. And so uh, I think I kind of hit a wall there. Uh, any comments, discussions? What gets people excited when they hear about this problem? What goes in your head? Uh, anyone online? Uh, anybody who has direct farming experience? I'm curious if anybody is a landowner here. It's. Uh, I think the thing that boy comes races through my head is some of the work that we do in Madagascar and just some trips to Madagascar itself. The first sight that you see when you get off and get out into the countryside is just as far as your eye can see burnt land. And a slash and burn is still the most common kind of a practice. And uh, I mean, and again, it was very important that you chose a specific country and a context to start with, because this will change from country to country. There might be more data, and we also have some field partners in Madagascar. So there might actually be, uh, if you want to do a comparison to it, and it has a huge implications, both on conservation and simultaneously on livelihood. And so I think, you know, in terms of the numbers game, it's still a very large island. I think it's the largest island, essentially. Uh, and one of the things that ends up happening uh, with that as a connection is the disease aspect for this too. Mm -hmm. So because, as, I mean, most of you have seen kind of California as in that air pollution index. Uh, and I think, yeah, on the educational front, uh, I could also see a massive scenario of, okay, how would you actually convince somebody to stop that and try something else? Yeah, I think based on my research, like the farmer themselves, they're experiencing these like bad health effects as well because they're yeah. standing in the smoke. So it's yeah. not like they want to do it necessarily. Yeah. It's yeah. more of just economically, there's no like frugal alternative right now. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, what this also brings us to is uh, folks have asked, uh, oh, uh, how should we start populating the idea board? So the reason I want you all to play with your uh, back of the envelope calculations is this immediately leads to an interest. It immediately leads to a question. And then now we can start going ahead and populating the idea board. Uh, there are two very specific things. I think in the idea board, we also have a section for soil and soil restoration in general. So this would fall into that category. And then of course, one of the huge aspect in soil restoration has really been about biological solutions to cell rep, uh, restoration, which is really in, in its infancy. Uh, and then the other space uh, that there are lots of partners that we talk to in the space for is measurement for the soil itself. So if you were to take two controlled lands, one in which this is happening, another one you follow another practice, how do you convince somebody by direct measurements? How do you pass those measurement tools themselves back to the people? Uh, that was a fabulous example. What was your name again? Varun. Varun. Okay, I'll switch to online. Uh, Alankrit, your hand is up. Uh, so go for it. Just briefly, um, what calculation did you do? So my, the, I was trying to find a parameter that could uh, give, us an, give us a quantitative idea about how many experiments does one kid in India in different schools have access to? Or the converse uh, way to look at it is, what is the burden on one experiment uh, in, in a school in an urban setting and in a rural setting in India? So for that, I tried to find the budget allocation for education. Uh, and I wanted to divide it by the total number of students who have access to that uh, budget allocation. But the problem that I ran into was that although state government budget allocation is known, but I 
but specific school uh, allocation is not really a transparent information. And we really cannot say that the the state state budget is distributed uniformly across all schools because I mean urban schools will obviously get more funds than a state than a government school in a rural setting in India. So that was the problem that I was running into. So and I guess it, 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 yeah, that's the roadblock. <laughs> yeah. Any comments? Uh, anybody have as an idea of how Lankrit could uh, wiggle his way out of that problem that he just described? that you start with data and you say, oh, that particular data I need is not available. What do you do? I mean, you're all gonna run into this problem very quickly, so might as well. Uh, and you know, the discussions that we had and just in general, there are other tools that you have at your uh, disposal. What comes to mind? Yeah, I think somebody on chat says uh, you could go up sort of like a bottom to top approach. You can talk to the yeah. talk to specific schools and do that. Yes, yeah. uh, I feel that, that this is a better approach than a top to bottom approach yeah. to this problem. So yeah, no, that I mean, makes sense. No, Thanks, I think it, with data, you need to be hungry. It's any and all. So if it's bottom yeah. up, find, find that simultaneously and find the approach from budgets. Uh, there was an idea in the class here. Yeah, I was actually going to say very similarly, like talking to a few schools. Uh -huh. um, if, I mean, if there's like a like a bi like bimodal population, then talk to both rural and yeah. urban. Also, if there's like a smaller subset where mm -hmm. the data is available, you can like narrow the problem down yeah. to where there is mm -hmm. information. Yeah, so I think I'll echo something like that. And again, this is in general for everybody in the class. Most of these problems are very large but context will matter significantly. So just to give you an idea in education, UP, Uttar Pradesh, some of you know that place, has you know uh, even more people than the entire country of Bangladesh, uh, Brazil. So you end up thinking about one tiny state, oh, that I'm thinking about this tiny state, and you realize, oh, wait a second, population densities in matter incredibly. And you might then say, oh, no, 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 that's even too large, too. You know, let me just concentrate on a specific district. Let me understand it at a granularity, which is actionable. And I think choose those granularities. So instead of country, because these practices will change so dramatically, you can focus on a region. And you might think that focusing on a smaller region, you are reducing your impact. You're actually making yourself more relevant, first of all. And if you succeed in that space, then you can have a scenario going the other way around. But just uh, knowing, was there anything, Alankrit, in terms of, I'm just now curious, uh, what is the density of uh, public schools, which would be traditionally what is called public schools here or government schools uh, in any state in India? Are there some numbers that jump out? Uh, like how many kids go to school in India? Is there any I mean, numbers you want to throw at people just so that they can put it in the back of their head? So I, I found the budget allocation for UP. It was 85,000 crores. So okay. you have I, to was, I was... It. You have to translate it okay. into <laughs> dollars. So what is that? 80, uh, uh, I'm at a blank now. <laughs> thousand crores. I'm just Googling it. Crores in USD. Uh so that's it is a billion dollars. That's, is that a billion dollars? Did you say 85,000, right? 85, yeah, 85,000. 85,000 crores. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rupees. Uh... Yeah, crore is always a uh, uh, one crore is how much? Gross billion. Is, is that a billion? Uh, oh, euro. I see. And it's also what is. Uh, yeah, crore is a is 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 a, is giga is uh and I think giga is a billion. So that's how I remember it. Okay, let's just do uh,
Uh, now, crores, how much did you say? Huh? It's 10 million. It's 10 million. Yeah. So, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, it's 10 billion. Would that be 10 billion US dollars? That sounds way too high. Are you? No, I don't think so. Alan, this is also the whole point of by the numbers. Uh, mm. You should dive in and doubt your source in, I think if $10 billion are spent in an educational budget in UP alone, uh, it just, I'm surprised, maybe that is actually true, uh, but it's valuable to kind of doubt in and tease that apart. And in terms of, do you know the total number of schools or kids served in- an Yeah, it is about 85, uh, 85 million 85 kids million. in 2000, 80, under, under 18 in 2011. Okay. So again, it's just- How many dollars per day. child? That's the number yeah. that you really yeah. actually care about. And but I, even that's not that's not a fair number, right? Because it's inequitable distribution. So that's yeah. where the subjectivity comes into. Yeah. But remember, picture. start start with the broader. Even if it's unfair, it would actually still be worth first knowing, mm -hmm. and then you can say, oh, by the way, this is a Gaussian distribution around an average or something. Uh, start with something where you have a very good idea. And I think this is sort of drives the point on education because both Parke brought up and Alunkrit brought up interest in education. Uh, in the US, and I think of course you guys can look the numbers in the US very clearly, uh, teachers buy supplies and pencils and things from their own salaries for their own students. And I'm talking about this is in the US. And so just uh, very broadly, the dollar spent per unit child in an educational context is extremely limited. And this is also where most of the educational interventions that we have thought about. So, you know, full scope is roughly around a dollar. And we have always been trying to push that number down further, primarily because it still makes it uh, to be uh, something that... Uh, cost is still an uh, issue, even at that price point itself, for example. Uh, but what would be valuable is when you are making these sets of calculations, uh, try finding numbers that are around and are relevant to that thing, even if they are not exactly what you were looking for first, or try estimating numbers around that space too, because I think what, will, what it will give folks is just this intuition for how big a hill you are trying to climb. And at that same time, also just the fact that, oh, wait a second, so much money is actually spent. Maybe it is about effective uh, uh, bringing sets of tools and technologies to make that framework effective rather than uh, you know, just it being spent. And uh, transparency is another factor in uh, this perspective. So I can tell you, for example, for the malaria budget from the president's uh, malaria fund, Every dollar is online and you can check exactly where that money went. And so just going back and looking at transparency and how these budgets are spent and borrowing templates from one and inspiring other folks to build the templates along those sides is actually by itself also very valuable. I see Tapan's hand. So maybe we'll just spend a minute or two on this and then I want to jump to the subject matter for today. Tapan, do you okay. want to unmute and share? What did you calculate? Yes. Uh, can you hear me clearly? We can hear you well. Yes. You can hear me. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, so my question was, uh, there, there's an organism, uh, there's a species called as Plo, uh, Prochlorococcus. Yes. Uh, which is the most abundant photosynthetic, which is supposedly the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the planet. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, and my question was, how much of the Prochlorococcus uh, does... Is, is, is transferred into car sequestered carbon, uh -huh. which is essentially the carbon that is transferred below mesopelagic zone of the ocean, which is below 1,000 meters. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, now, uh, so uh, I, I've, tried to, I've tried to go a way of figuring out how much of water there is in the oceans, uh -huh. which, is, which is a neat number of 1, 2, 3, 4 quintillion liters. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then I try to figure out how much of it is within the epipelagic zones and then how much of it is within oligotrophic zones because yeah. uh, prochlorococcus is majorly in oligotrophic zones. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and then 
uh, there are experiments which are conducted, which figured out how much each cell of prochlorococcus can weigh, mm -hmm. which is in femtograms, one, 60 to 158 femtograms. Yeah. And then I, I decided that this is not, this is not turning out to be a Fermi problem, but, but more of a precise surgical answer. And so I tried to figure, go in a different route. Uh -huh. uh, also because I couldn't figure out how to calculate the 10 powers and I, I didn't, okay, there wasn't enough time to, and anyway, so, so I went the different route of coming from uh, the total primary productivity of the about 50 gigatons of carbon. Uh -huh. This is uh, and it's it's similar in in terrestrial biomass, but uh, sticking to oceans is 50 gigatons of carbon. Out of 50 gigatons, five gigatons to 12 gigatons goes to uh, goes below epipelagic zones. Uh -huh. So so this is uh, this is about 10% uh, to 24% of 15 gigatons, mm -hmm. right? Five gigatons to 12 gigatons is 10% to 24%. Now, and then I, I, I looked up what is the primary uh, productivity of prochlorococcus itself, if somebody has, has any number of it, which it turns out somebody has it, it's four gigatons. Uh -huh. Four gigatons of carbon. Now, uh, of the four gigatons of carbon, I, I, I looked up what could be the 10% to 24% of carbon that, that goes from epipelagic to mesopelagic zones, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which turned out to be Jesus Christ. No, no, it didn't turn out to be Jesus. It's about 0.4 gigatons to one gigatons. It's okay. about 25 percent. So 0.4 yeah. gigatons to one gigatons. Yeah. Now and then, so but then the question, my question was, uh, what happens? What goes beyond mesopelagic? So from uh, epipelagic to mesopelagic, the, the idea is 0.4 gigatons to one gigatons. Mm -hmm. So bit uh, after in the mesopelagic, how much of it is remineralized? Mm -hmm. And so I looked up, so uh, at the end, uh, towards the beginning, starting of this class, I looked up what the respiration rate in mesopelagic zone was, mm -hmm. which turned out to be 70% of the entire dark ocean. So entire carbon that enters through photosynthesis, it remineralizes in the, in the water layer. Mm -hmm. Less than 1% goes to the bottom of the ocean. So, and, and out of that, uh, out of that 100%, 70% respiration happens within the mesopelagic zone. Mm -hmm. So and then thirty percent happens beyond mesopelagic zone, mm -hmm. and so I, I so I had to subtract the seventy percent from uh, 0 0.4 to one gigatons, uh, which turned out to be uh, seven uh, point point uh, one two gigatons to 0.3 gigatons of prochlorococcus. Mm -hmm. That's the for me. That's uh, that's where I, I can I can reconcile this with the the previous uh, attempt, which is one, two, three, four, quintillion tons, and then calculating the my mass of prochlorococcus. Mm -hmm. As in, I can see if they match, how close they come to each other. Yeah, I uh, think. But first, as first of all, uh, this is fantastic. You have a very specific question, and you are attacking it from multiple different ways. One of the simplest thing would be is uh, write up, and this is a homework, so everybody should do it. Uh, I'm not going to check, but you guys should check each other because these are actually pretty interesting problems and everyone's uh, problem you should be excited about reading, providing comments. So Tapan, write that up and post that in the Discord channel. Uh, okay. It's actually very relevant to where we ended the class uh, last Thursday. And uh, I was going to talk about something different, but maybe depending on time, I might actually just spend time today telling you guys about more on the carbon side of the story then, because it will very naturally fit and gives us that one hour window. But there are a couple of things I wanted to mention before we jump. So when you're doing these calculations, there is a lot of numbers that you will find. And unless you can find a source and the method that they used for it, I mean, one thing is you literally found the data. So when it's budget, you found the data, you just trust that data because, oh, I trust that data. But there's all kinds of other estimates that are thrown. And if you don't know the raw data and how it was calculated, the purpose should be is that you should go around and see uh, what estimate they, they use because you're building estimates on estimates and you don't want to be in a situation where you cannot explain every aspect of that estimate. So if or at least you need to know what other people's estimates were built on. So either you have raw data or you have the entire pipeline because what ends up happening is there is lots of times in science when people said something and then it turned out to be absolutely wrong. 
Uh, and that made a big story because uh, we had just estimated something and that estimate was quite far off. So anytime you're using other people's estimates, if it's not raw data and you're not computing it from scratch, try to make sure and see, can you follow their own uh, rationale in terms? And I think with the sedimentation, the reason I'm mentioning this is uh, as a lab, we focus quite a lot on that at the microscopic scale. And we are realizing that many of the assumptions that we are making in that space don't fit actual experimental data. And that's really also the hard challenge of why measurement tools and technologies are actually important. Okay, so I'm very excited. I think uh, you all are getting the hang of this. Please try to do this. Uh, share very detailed notes. And I think another example is if you write something and it's not clear to someone, then the most single thing that they will do is they will doubt that calculation. But if you do write that cleanly and clearly and try to follow the logic, it might be in the act when you do that calculation, uh, it's all over them. <laughs> it's a mess. And then you go and clean it up to say, oh, can I logically build this? Uh, and so this is sort of, this is a two-step process. First is you try something, you get somewhere, and then you cleanly type that up. Okay, so I think since you mentioned uh, this as a context, maybe I'm gonna switch and uh, continue a little bit on finishing uh, the oceans discussion, uh, because last time we had, uh, discussed and spent some time on uh, much of, uh, I think we had talked about lots of problems per se, but we had not talked too much about the sampling side. So I'm gonna maybe just give some broad open challenges on where uh, sampling issues lie, and then actually go back and very much talk about uh, uh, this idea around sequestration. So let's uh, let's start here. Uh, let me see if I can hide video, hide floating controls. Okay, I'm assuming you all can see my screen now, right? Uh, so first of all, uh, some of you got the chance to ponder at the lake, and that's a pretty small water body compared to uh, important water bodies on the planet. Uh, but you could still think about the fact that when you stand right next to it, it feels overwhelming. I mean, you know, from a context of microorganisms, how would you even if you wanted to say something quantitative about that lake? It's a non-trivial exercise. And so this is where volumes and other things sort of matter of how often and how automated do we need the sets of tools to be, to be truly able to tell what's happening in a given water body. So that'll give you an appreciation of how undersampled the ocean is, uh, is that life is dynamic uh, in all of these places. And I think I'll kind of demonstrate that by showing you guys one of my favorite uh, dive movies. Uh, I did not collect this one. I wish I was there, but uh, uh, I do want to show you for at least for someone what that felt like. And I guess the the context of this is when we say we are trying to sample, what do we really mean? We are collecting physical parameters on the ocean, and we'll talk a little bit about but we're also trying to collect biological parameters. And you can see, uh, you know, both in the context of density and diversity of the kind of life that can actually exist in the pockets of hot biodiversities. Uh, so if you were, uh, you know, how do you even make sense of much of this? And as Tuppen was starting to describe, it is important to make sense of this purely, not just from a descriptive perspective, but also from a perspective of carbon sequestration, because the entire ocean biological pump that we are talking about here is driven by uh, much of this life sinking to the bottom of the ocean, which was kind of part of his calculation. So if you were to look at these sets of numbers, 
uh, almost half of the oxygen that's removed uh, from the atmosphere is removed through this context of sinking. Just stuff makes carbon, sinks to the bottom. And so I think we need to get a handle in terms of just thinking about what does it mean to actually measure. Uh, another way of just taking the same problem uh, and thinking about that from a global perspective is... Uh, this is a simulation of what uh, a group at MIT, this is called the MIT Darwin Project, uh, Mick Follows Lab. Uh, it's another computational engine. I think now they have a Google Earth plug into it too. And they are just simulating the total biomass. So this is another, you know, simulations are just much more uh, uh, structured way of thinking about estimates because they still are estimates because you would start with some assumption. So the assumptions that they made is, oh, we know a lot about the chemistry of the ocean. And with that chemistry, uh, this is the density of life that it would support. And what they are trying to simulate, for example, is what might appear uh, from the context of satellites. So and you can see the data that's mirrored on the terrestrial, that dynamics is real. That's from satellites. And you can see the greening changing over time, that's seasons while what's happening in the ocean is also seasonal, but now that's simulated. And uh, some of that, of course, there is certain sets of uh, satellites, but you can use that satellite data uh, as a starting point uh, to build more sophisticated simulations around all kinds of species that might actually exist. So the challenge per se is that, you know, how do you really measure uh, the ocean at this kind of a scale in a frugal type of a context? Uh, and one thing to sort of keep in mind, going back to the carbon budget side of the story, this would be a fun calculation if anybody wants to do. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to the uh, Dover, UK. Has anybody been to UK? Uh, is anybody in the class collect connecting from UK? Uh, or any of the folks have been to the Dover Mountains? Uh, there are many movies in which these mountains show up. Uh, I think the last one I'm trying to remember, maybe some Harry Potter movie also. Uh, but the the idea is that this mountain range that you're seeing, you know, to scale a human would be maybe that size right there. Uh, this entire mountain is made of five micron cells. And so this is literal proof of carbon sequestration of the ocean when sets of biomass will fall to the bottom. And you know that cell that you're looking at, that's ehoxili, and uh, uh, these are single cells, these are fairly small cells, and then they're all falling to the bottom. And this is what Tuppen was trying to calculate now for pro Prochlococcus, uh, which is a more photosynthetic organism. Uh, but one of the threads to think a little bit about would be is sediments in the ocean can be incredibly deep. Uh, all across uh, our planet. And they have this historic record for uh, everything that lived long time ago. And this is also why some of the sampling techniques, it's incredibly expensive, but they go, so at some point of time, this entire mountain was under the ocean. And so of course we have all of these things right under the ocean as well. And a lot of coring techniques are actually used to be able to get to the core and identify. And in these cores, you can actually say, for example, see most of the major meteoroid strikes. So when the planet changed dramatically, all of that is recorded in this uh, record per se. Uh, and I think maybe uh, one important thing I do want to mention, uh, and then we'll kind of jump to measurement technologies, is just, uh, I think, one important aspect of the sets of calculations and the measurement and the measurement gap that we we're talking about is the time of it is very critical because currently, of course, uh, there is starting to be a much more of a societal understanding in a much more broader context that you know a lot of change is happening right around us. And at that same time, we are getting better and better at trying to make those estimates. I think there are certain sets of estimates that we are quite far off where what we are thinking is actually still too optimistic. For example, the sea ice melting, every one of those predictions, it's, mel it's melting faster than our prediction. So we don't know. 
And there are other scenarios in which we overestimate and underestimate. So as scientists, one of the key things we have to do is find and fill the gaps. So if any of you kind of think about the ocean side of the story, I absolutely love this paper. It's a very serious paper. And what it talks really about is this imbalance between the geochemical and the biochemical indicators of the meso and bathypelagic biological activity. And they are just pointing out that there are still gaps in our carbon budgets. So we cannot account for all the carbon that we are pumping. You can call it the missing carbon problem, just like I had described the missing microplastic problem. And uh, I don't know, uh, often enough, you can't get that language across uh, reviewers in a published paper. But I mean, I didn't make this up. This is I didn't paste that thing on that is that's the title of their paper. Uh, it's actually a very serious paper, but just just this notion of uh, taking these numbers seriously and hopefully that it points us to the certain sets of directions is actually very important. Okay, so I think let's go back to uh, sampling oceans. I just want to briefly mention a few sets of technical uh, challenges around, and uh, we can also brainstorm some of the ocean-oriented projects in that context. Uh, so, you know, I think, of course, one of the big things that we covered last time is 97% uh, uh, of all water, 70% of all area. So, you know, it's not a surprise that it's a big problem. Uh, this is literally currently what we like to get from satellites. Uh, so temperature, all ocean warming data is coming from sets of satellites. There's a lot of uh, currents and waves, and I think David last time had hinted towards this in the context of a uh, larger number of uh, on-water networks and buoys to get the waves data. Uh, chlorophyll is really one of the biggest things that we really try to get, uh, and so this you can see is the chlorophyll concentration. Uh, these data sets are live. There are lots of sets of sites that you can go online in terms of trying to get uh, the ocean color. Uh, and you can then actually just look at time series, you can look at seasonal data, all of this data is out there. And it's actually quite fun. Uh, and I think one way of thinking about it is that satellites have gotten us quite far. But at this point, it's also incredibly important to think about onboard uh, non satellite based data sets. Uh, there is a huge movement in computer science now to very quantitatively analyze satellite data. So related to farming practices, for example, there are several sets of projects that try to estimate GDP, per capita income, all based on number of light bulbs people turn on at night. Uh, so there is a, a huge, because now we can, uh, using machine learning, we can actually quantitatively say something, total number of roads, places where road development hasn't happened. So, you know, I think I'm not saying that there is a lot still to be done with satellite data itself, and it's what you have. Uh, but from a perspective of the class, I think what I'm very excited about is also just making sure we identify the gaps and we fill them. And so here are some sets of technologies uh, that fill this. And so one example for these are Argo floats. Uh, this is a beautiful set of a tool. You can see it's a kind of a sensor. Uh, they are scattered all across. Uh, one of the challenges is that they are incredibly expensive currently in some sense. Uh, they are, uh, I don't remember, I'm trying to think about the lifetime of these tools. They have one time battery. So I think it'll last a couple of years and then they sink to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and you know, you can actually see uh, how extensive this network is. And one of the aspects of the Argo float by design is that they sink to the bottom and they have a buoyancy engine, and then it comes back to the top. So they're also making vertical axis measurements, unlike what you would do purely on the satellite. Now, these sets of tools, every one of them can be between fifty dollars to $60,000. If you start adding more tools to it, then it starts to add up cost itself. Like, for example, there is a couple examples with UVPC cameras. And so then you can see the budget starts to explode if you're going to uh, do something extensive. And this is the cost uh, performance trade-off that we've been struggling with. Uh, what's really fun is that the Argo's uh, satellite, uh, much of the Argo float data is all online. So if I go in here 
and look at the set of a program, I can try finding. So everybody should get a chance. If you're excited about the ocean side of the story, do read about this program. It's one of the most extensive and well-supported program in the past. Uh, and what I'm excited to see is if I can find the live, uh, uh, there is a live feed associated with this. And you can see that that's what I meant, that if any of you, has anybody downloaded Google Earth yet? Uh, so this is, you can see Argo Google Earth layer. So many data sets just plug in. And so you can do computations on Google Earth. You can start kind of mapping and you can find these sets of data sets. Uh, so let's just go to a dashboard. Uh, I was just curious to see if we can find just live data sets from uh, these sets of instruments. And again, you know, this is powerful uh, because effectively uh, 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 this is live. And so uh, we're going to see, let's see what pops up here for a second. Uh, and so seems like all of these floats are live. And if I go in here, I just chose that. And uh, last info came on the first. And I can go track line. Just want to get an intuition for what all data is associated with this float. Uh, that's a second float. Yeah, so you can tell that as a number. Um, usually, I'm able to pull out all the data sets. So right here is the data set. You can see uh, the sets of things associated with what was in uh, the float itself, uh, both of the design. And then you can actually pull out the entire data set for that specific one. So. Uh, and I see David's hand. David, go ahead. David, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. Um, I just one thing I wanted to say about the um, the Argo network is sometimes when you see these maps, yeah. and this is you know having been an ocean, you think, oh, they've got it all covered. No. <laughs> and and I think it's a real first of all it, the 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 dots and the pixels make it seem like it's all covered, but there's really a lot of space. And I think there's another thing that has been surprising to me working in this is when we started so far, we were building these buoys. And mm -hmm. what I realized, what we realized um, is that this isn't really capturing wave and wind data. So yeah. it seems like, oh, they have all these sensors and they're doing these things, but there are massive gaps, yeah. not just, um, and so, I mean, I can show you, yeah. and we've got, so far, Ocean has all that data. So if somebody wants that data, we can get that for them. The yeah, other I thing think is one idea that would be very valuable just as a case study, it might be fun to just do a case study on so far's hardware itself. Uh, and so maybe one thing I can do is, David, I can ping you on a specific time that might work for that. Because what would be very valuable to just also get a sense for, uh, how does uh, in a startup context uh, initiating and and again you know Argo also started as a project in that same space itself. Uh, all of these data sets also have to talk to each other too, and they're all complementary. And so it would actually be very valuable uh, to get a sense. And so David, if you are up for that, what might be fun would be is kind of like a half an hour deep dive. Uh, on the next ocean session that's uh, dedicated on so far, because I would actually be excited to know where they are and where they're going as well. So sure. are you up for that? Uh, yeah, I could even yeah. do more than so far. We've got, I've been a part of three or four projects now that have- Yeah, this, no, so no, I, I think absolutely. Broader. I think it would be really kind of fun to get an intuition for this uh, from a context of just uh, what has happened more recently. And again, the whole purpose of all of this is to really build enough case studies that everybody sees a path forward to say, oh, how do I actually contribute in this uh, perspective? Uh, one of the things that David pointed out is, you know, this is Lagrangian tracking. So these two types of data sets have uh, different uh, uh, diversification in some sense of what you would actually want to do. One is where your particle that you're mapping is actually floating and swimming with uh, the water column that you are trying to measure. Uh, and then the other side of that story is uh, where it's anchored. And we will talk a little bit about why anchoring is also important because you might want to 
uh, from a geographical context want to make a certain class of measurements that are anchored to a given point. And so, you know, I think the other part about the cost and associated with uh, uh, what's powerful about these sets of things, they would go around a thousand meters. So you do get very deep uh, compared to anything a satellite would ever be able to do. And here is kind of the, the cost challenge is that uh, with the mission and everything and the deployment, uh, these things can be roughly around $100,000 uh, per unit. And that's kind of the real reason for why having a much broader scale of sensors and tools becomes very valuable. They're lost all the time, uh, you know, I think. So in some sense, uh, I still really love this program for how they have scaled up. Uh, but there is, as David was pointing out, rather than saying there's plenty of room at the bottom, there's plenty of room in the ocean. Uh, mm -hmm. And the thing that I think I'll now talk a little bit about is the these are still macroscopic measurements. And so we will talk a little bit about the microscopic side of the story as well. And uh, another program that I kind of want to mention is uh, this one, which is very historic. So for some of you who saw planktoscopes and uh, will continue finishing to build the, uh, the scopes itself, uh, but the historic anchor for that is what is now described as the oldest uh, running project uh, on the microscopic front in the ocean. Uh, and uh, one of the phenomenal aspects of this uh, is kind of the historic framework for how this came about. Uh, so what you're looking at is uh, called a CPR. It's a continuous plankton recorder. What's incredible about this as a tool and, you know, to the ingenious nature of the people that built this, including Alistair Hardy, is it has no batteries. It has, it has, it has nothing other than pure mechanics. Uh, and what it has, if I was to open this up, is essentially two silk screens that run. Uh, you basically hook it to any boat behind a large enough boat. Many shipping vessels carry them now. And as the currents move, uh, you can see the nozzle, that tip nozzle essentially brings water in. There are two uh, sheets that are driving and then they seal on top and they capture. So unlike a plankton net, it's like a plankton net on a giant reel. And this silk roll has been a historic track of what was there in the past. And then this silk roll after this has done many sets of uh, hundreds of thousands of miles of towing around, however long a net or a roll that you could fit in in a barrel, that gets sent to a centralized uh, place where these things are analyzed. The analysis of this is a giant mess. It's very difficult to analyze. You can see you're going to unroll it off. But just the reality is that because this program has been running for more than 50 years, I think, uh, the important aspect of this is that we can go back to those roles even 50 years from now, possibly, and then take a look and get a sense to see what was actually there. And especially, I think one space where this has become incredibly critical is ocean acidification, because a lot of marine larvae with acidification cannot make their shells. So you can identify them and you can go back and say, okay, 50 years ago, the exact same place, this was the shell thickness. And now that has changed. And that gives us a very direct metric and a measure of, uh, although you might say that the amount of parameter change or value is very limiting, it has a huge implication on a biological side of the story. Uh, so just, you know, I think it's also a little bit about robustness of thinking about your tools uh, and, uh, there are very few tools in oceanography that depend on absolutely no power. So it's a self-powering tool. And that's why I really love this tool as an example. Um, and again, you know, a lot has been said about this as a program. So you should all just read. Uh, there's a couple of links. I'm just leaving this here for people to see. Uh, 1930s is when the program started. It is in general hard to run programs that are purely scientific value in our world for long enough time. So many sets of monitoring programs in an ecological context die out after five to 10 years because interests move somewhere else. 
so that by itself, and so Alistair Hardy Foundation that was set up uh, has anchored much of this program uh, by trying to continue this. And again, all of this is done on shipping vessels and other threads, uh, which they are leveraging. They don't pay anything for any ships uh, or ship time because we have ship traffic significantly. The downside is it's only related to the lanes for shipping traffic. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, this is where archives matter. Uh, I have had, uh, I think this is another set of a thing. If somebody has an interest uh, in digitization technologies for archives, uh, because it turns out that even the past sets of fossil records and archives teach us significantly. So just take a look at these two images. Uh, these are foraminiferas, uh, and these are single cells. Uh, they also make a shell. Uh, it's a hard shell, so they make a single cell fossil. And you can see the fossil from 2009 and 2013. And you can see that from the HMS Challenger, uh, some of the earliest expeditions. And this was 1872. And you know this is the same species, uh, exactly the same sets of uh, uh, cells, but they were making. And one of the things that people have done is use this as a fossil record to identify what was the pH of our oceans back then, because we were not measuring it at that time. So how do you actually use purely biological fossils as a quantitative metric? And because we know so much about foraminiferas, it's actually feasible uh, to identify and really ground uh, what you might actually think about in terms of uh, what this means from the context of about calculating uh, uh, pH, for example, or acidity. For uh, The other type of uh, fossil record that exists is diatoms. Uh, this is another sort of a space to sort of think about in terms of species distribution. Uh, much of this is primarily archival at this point. I don't think we are using uh, these types of data sets as effectively as we should because we don't have the type of tools. Uh, and especially when it comes to microscopic fossils, uh, it's much harder because uh, you know the digitization and other sets and also telling what can you quantitatively say about it is hard. So, but all of these archival information essentially already exist in and amongst us. Uh, and it is valuable while we continue to uh, look at what's present. Uh, it is a hugely important sets of tools. So if anybody is thinking about sets of tools, uh, looking backwards, so what can we learn from what had happened when we were not there? Uh, so... I think in terms of just the number of tools, here is the now sort of switching a little bit to the small world. Uh, I love this as a framework of, you know, I think at some point of time, I should add planktoscope here and add uh, CPR here as well. It's not here, but you can see this is the range of size of the organisms in the ocean, all the way to bacteriophage, uh, all the way to giant jellies. Uh, so this is in microns in some sense. So. Uh, uh, and one of the threads that you can start thinking about is none of the technologies uh, cover everything. This Coulter counter is, uh, the history of that comes from medicine. So any of you have used, uh, you know, many sets of uh, body counts like uh, uh, blood cell types, all of those are measured on these incredible machines called Coulter counters. Somebody had an idea of applying that to oceanography. And that led to the measurements of bacterial concentrations, for example. You can start going up. Here is flow cytometry, something again invented for biomedicine, actually used fairly well and routinely now. Uh, this is flow camps right here. And you can see that uh, by just switching the objectives, we can fairly easily uh, switch. So this would be the same range for planktoscopes. Zoo scans are kind of fun. Uh, they're basically. Uh, uh, essentially paper scanners, like I'm sure all of you have used the scanners with the white light. Uh, they are on board and many ships where people just take scans and pictures. Uh, and I think many of these other sets of tools, maybe I'll just mention UVP. Uh, UVP is essentially a tool that's designed for taking live imaging, but underwater. And this has been challenging, but is one of the most promising sets of threads that does something completely in situ 
where when you drop something in the ocean, it will essentially make a measurement uh, of microscopic uh, particles and organisms. But as you can see, it cannot go beyond. So 100 micron is sort of where it starts. It doesn't measure anything below the 100 micron range. Uh, and I think it is very important to spread our measurement technologies because eventually you will end up in a situation where uh, the mass distribution would be completely off. Just because they are small doesn't mean they make up by abundance. So I think that's kind of an important metric to think about. Uh, and so far, a lot of sampling techniques have really focused on sequencing. Uh, and I think imaging has lagged far behind. And that was also one of the big motivations of starting to build imaging-based tools. So as you're sort of thinking about this, uh, uh, we all know that sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper, and I think that has been really rapidly applied per se. Uh, but the challenge currently in oceanography and sampling is that we have more sequencing data, but we don't know what it belongs to. Uh, and I think this is the very first time something like this has happened, where you would get a sequence uh, and we have absolutely no idea what type of an organism it came from. Uh, Okay, any questions? Then I'm gonna jump in to tell you about one technology that we have been developing uh, on this microscopic side. But uh, uh, any, any sets of comments slash questions before I dive in into sequestration side of the story? Any threads on? I guess maybe one thing to kind of keep in mind is the on the oceanography side, uh, do go to the idea board, certain sets of threads, and depending on a subset of people, I definitely am super excited about making sure we seed one or two teams on the oceanography side. So this is also just true for uh, anybody online itself as well. Uh, I'll, I'll seed some of the idea boards on that front, uh, but it'll actually be very valuable uh, to get a sense uh, of number of people that are actually interested, because then we can have a dedicated, because we can talk about a given area at an infinite amount of depth, but it might actually be valuable to do that as a sub team. Uh, so maybe one thing that we should do, Ellie, is on the idea board, uh, if people can put their names on the categories, even before saying the kinds of projects so that we will have certain sets of discussions purely on the education side or purely on the uh, environmental context or purely on the medicine context. So I think that would actually be valuable to pair up uh, and uh, align people in that space. Yes. I have a quick question. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Imaging side of things. Yeah. So I know like, in terrestrial areas, there's been a lot with like camera shops and trying to use like AI to identify the species that like you take pictures of. Yeah. So I was wondering if anything like that has been applied to like marine. Yeah, I think there is a beautiful project that came out of Ambari, MIT, and a couple other friends. Uh, they have been looking at all this diving footage that people collect because as divers, that's just free citizen science. And then they have been able to use that to build a massive, uh, it is quite a hard machine learning problem because organisms in the ocean love camouflage. So you could take a picture of a reef and try counting yourself how many fish are there, but those estimates are incredibly important. And I think the one reason that I'm reminded, I forgot to put that in here, but that's definitely another space of macroscopic because underwater cameras have become so common. Unfortunately, the one of the challenges also associated with this that it's uh, the systematic surveys are still very important because we are very biased around the kind of free data that's accessible. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there will be certain sets of popular spots, people, while the declining spots where nobody wants to go, we still need data from that same source. Uh, there are several organizations uh, that try organizing expeditions that are very specifically uh, like coral bleaching, for example, there is a massive amount of effort associated when bleaches happen to have community members to go out uh, and record those bleaching events. Another one that's, uh, it's called the jellyfish tracker. It's another citizen science project where people, whenever they see a jellyfish, they take a photo of it and they upload that to that site. And that makes a map of distribution of jellyfish in general. And, uh, and of course, you know, this all started with some of the very poisonous jellyfish 
but now it's much more broader and it also has the context of conservation itself. So I think uh, the, the challenge is sampling bias, but other than that, I think it's a phenomenal. And of course, now there are autonomous vehicles like Trident and OpenROV and other threads in which you can also collect that data. Okay, so I'm going to tell you guys about uh, kind of this intermediate strategy of a tool that we have been developing as a lab. Uh, and because uh, this is the area that uh, we work in in this space, uh, and it has uh, its context uh, on to the carbon sequestration side of the story. So I think so far we talked about the ocean uh, in a very static way. And so this is now a dynamic view of the ocean. And uh, what I love about this animation is if folks can see this is uh, there is something rising and falling as a function of light. And so you can see uh, here are organisms. Let's just watch a pool of organisms. You know, they are rising. And then when the night falls, they go down. And this happens to be across the ocean uh, uh, I'm going to play a video for you guys uh, because uh, it'll also add a little entertainment to this, but uh, it's actually quite fun. So I'll just play this for a second so you understand the historic perspective for this. Let's just see uh, uh, the history of how this was discovered. During World War II, American sonar researchers encountered a mystery an echo from what seemed like the ocean bottom, but at depths where no bottom should be. Even stranger, the false bottom moved. Deep in daytime, it crept closer to the surface as the sun went down. Was this phantom bottom enemy submarines, water currents, or maybe something more mysterious? Trawling the depths with nets and dives by early submersibles revealed the answer. Fish, trillions and trillions of them. The sonar mystery revealed life in a part of the ocean where none was thought to be, the mesopelagic zone. So, we can go the on. open ocean, everything except the coast and bottom is not the same at different depths. It's made up of habitats defined by currents, pressure, and temperature, but most of all, by light. From the surface to around 200 meters is the epipelagic zone. Enough sunlight can penetrate here for photosynthetic organisms to thrive, and abundant light feeds on these organisms. The mesopelagic is below, from around 200 to 1,000 meters. Though the ocean is often much deeper, that's deep enough that almost no light penetrates, making it very hard to explore until recently. Okay, so I think this goes on and uh, talks a little bit about, I'll post this video. Uh, I love the historical context for it. And I think the way that it was described to me is uh, in a sense, uh, when some of these sonars, it was a new technology. And then when it came out, uh, they reported that the seafloor is rising. And most of the other folks didn't believe that, you know, how is that possible? Seafloor doesn't rise up in days. There must be something wrong in your instrument. And they went back in and again. And this is one of the big reasons the Navy actually funded a significant portion of biological oceanography. And then of course, early on, there was uh, one of the hunch from that signal is coming from, uh, uh, that it's coming from the fish. Uh, but it actually, it's also at every scale. Uh, so this is that sonar signal. Uh, you can see at the, the, this is kind of the daytime, this is midday, a biomass, something is going down and it's coming back up again. It's very sharp. And so when we're trying to sample, we're actually trying to sample in these sharp zones. And then there's all kinds of biological reasons for why uh, the ocean is organized this way. Uh, but one of the factors to think about it is it's not just the macroscopic things, as they said in the fish. The fish are actually chasing the microscopic things. And so what's driving much of this, what we believe, is, uh, is the smaller scale. And there is a food chain cascade associated with that. 
And what the sonar is picking up is something which is a scattering signal from the largest sets of objects. Uh, at that time, there was an incredible amount of work that was done. Uh, many fish have these uh, bladders that are filled with gas. So they have a huge scattering signal from sonar. And so a ton of work was done on trying to understand because what was the worry that the Navy had is if this is the case, you could sneak under it at night and all of our technologies associated with uh, stealth uh, because submarines were of course a thing at that time and you wanted to know if there is a submarine in the water so you create a sonar wall but if this rises up and down it will give you just the right uh, camouflage to essentially go under it uh, so I think, but there is a, a much more important reason to kind of think about this now. So first of all, uh, one way of exploring this is just thinking about the energy budget of this migration itself, uh, because it's the world's largest biomass migration. So it's not the Serengeti, it's, uh, it really is much of the biomass migration is here. And then this is what we have been focusing on quite a lot uh, in the last four years. Uh, this is how we currently measure uh, the context of thinking about uh, what this carbon sequestration actually looks like. So if you think about the carbon that's pumped in, we had talked about all of the organic life that's going to form uh, biomass here, that biomass sinks. And you have to think about if you could go and measure at a given point, how much of that biomass has sunk per unit area you would have a good estimate of thinking about the carbon flux at that point. Uh, and so uh, anybody sees any kind of challenges in this as an approach? So this is the current approach. Uh, this is how we currently do almost all of the carbon export estimations. Uh, this is, that goes in the IPCC reports. Everything that you have read about the numbers that we have been throwing out that the ocean absorbs 20, uh, gigaton and uh, all of those sets of things are actually calculated from this. So anybody sees problems, uh, what can you, I mean, of course, uh, uh, it's fabulous that we have something like this, but what, what are the challenges that you could think about in measuring carbon and sequestration this way? Say that again. Oh, uh, let me look at the chat. Uh, how do I access the chat? Oh, right there. Yes, <laughs> research cruises are expensive, uh, very important. And I think, you know, the research cruises by themselves are per day. We were discussing 50 to uh, $60,000 per day. Any, anything else? Yeah, it's all gravity based. Oh, go ahead, Tapan. It, it seems it's it's all gravity based. As in, there are organisms which which may escape these uh, traps mm -hmm. just because they they do not uh, they're not obligated to obey the grab. As in, they move. Yeah, I think uh, Tapan, maybe there was uh, what this is designed around is to capture dead biomass. And then the gravity is the mechanism that's sinking them down. So this, these traps are not for tracking organisms for biodiversity measurement. It is for measuring the total carbon flux that's going down. And so much of that matter is sinking and is actually dead, or now it's not completely dead. Uh, we know that, but uh, it's under the force of gravity. What were you going to say? Oh, yeah. I was going yeah. to say something similar. Yeah. Like control of how much it's going up and down. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I think there was a little bit of a confusion. It's good to clarify. When life is alive, it does this up and down uh, sets of migrations. Uh, but once it's dead, uh, the average cell density is roughly, for any cell average on the ocean, is 5 to 10% heavier than seawater. And so a dead cell starts to sink. And I'll show you guys data in that context. Uh, and that sinking is what you want to capture. And you want to capture per unit area how much of that sinking is happening. And the reason I can't just say, oh, everything is, I know what is alive. And then if everything dies, 
why do we need to measure it? It's all going to sink to the bottom. And the answer is no, because the microbes take over and the bacteria take over. And before it can sink, they essentially consume it back again. That's called the microbial pump. This is the biological pump. And this is why you have to measure it. Because if there is higher microbial activity, you get nothing. You get no sequestration. And if there is low uh, activity during the time it can sink, that's when you get a high flux. So one of the contexts of thinking about this is also just uh, the challenge is we really have no, we have no perspective or resolution on what are the processes that are causing these things to happen. And you know it's been an anchor point for a lot of research per se. Uh, but the only thing we can measure is these average population, these chunks that fall to the bottom. And, you know, lots of, I don't know how many of you have seen the videos uh, of the deep sea submersibles. If you take a close look at it, most of the time you'll see just this haze that's falling. And it's called marine snow for this reason, because it feels like snow. Uh, and we really don't have the microscopic view. And then the analogy that I'll give related to this is how we have understood how rainfall falls. So in the clouds, incredible things are happening and we see just the droplets, but at the beginning of that process is actually all ice crystals uh, and it's all seeded by microbes to begin with. And so if you don't understand the sets of processes that are at play at the, in, unless you can actually directly measure what's happening in the clouds, it's very hard to estimate what conditions you should cause there to get a given amount of rainfall. And you know, this is not a hypothetical exercise. Weather control has been used in the past. It's been used in the Vietnam War to cause rain on a given patch of land, but it's also used as, a, uh, as one thing in the tool of geoengineering because you can see clouds. So you know, once you understand the process, there is the scenario of uh, its utilization, but Currently, we don't understand the process per se. And I think kind of the physics of this, uh, which uh, now goes back uh, to an important thing to sort of think a little bit about, is uh, there is a, a diatom and a penny. So if you were to drop a penny uh, somewhere, you know, average uh, ocean depth might be around four or so kilometers. That'll take a couple of hours, but it will reach the bottom of the ocean. Um, don't drop pennies in the ocean. Uh, but if you do, that's the, but if you drop a cell, it'll actually take three years. And the reason for that is actually very simple. This is this thing called the Stokes. And again, and this is in an inertial regime, so it's, it's a little bit different. But one of the things that will happen is you can start seeing that when something is heavier than water, the way it sinks, it reaches that terminal velocity. And that's the function of the density and the product and the radius square. And that's incredibly important. So you can see larger the particle, the faster it will sink. Faster it sinks, it can escape that microbial pump and reach that thousand meter mark. If you've reached the thousand meter mark, you've actually locked carbon in the ocean uh, for, uh, I think it's around 100 to 500 years. Uh, these sets of estimates exist for the depth and the total number of years you lock carbon in. So this is kind of an important time all of the carbon sequestration technologies that are sort of working towards this in the ocean uh, are thinking about uh, approach to get more carbon below this thousand meter limit. And all of that is just driven by this type of a physics. Uh, now, the problem with much of that is that it has not been possible to measure the microscopic context of what happens. And so I think since I'm almost out of town, I'll just mention two expeditions that as a lab, uh, there is uh, Ellie right there on uh, a boat. Uh, and one of the things that we've been doing is building kinds of tools uh, to directly measure the sequestration uh, by trying to understand the microscopic processes in play. And so the video that you're about to watch is literally the very first time uh, something like this has been captured on camera. So I'll just play this. Uh, it might not look so exciting, but to me, it's one of the most exciting things uh, uh, over the last year, actually. Uh, so I'll just let you watch this. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we did this. But what we've been able to do in this is to sync with the particles themselves. Uh, and there is a trick associated with it. But what you're watching 
and I'll play this from the very beginning just to appreciate. You can see lots of live cells. So that's a uh, Seracium right there. Uh, that is incredible. I think either it's a Hillosphere or an Acantharian. Uh, you can see some cells embedded in this mass, but this is a goop of dead stuff that is sticky. And there are many other dead cells right there as well. And as these things interact with each other, uh, they ag aggregate. And this aggregation process is what drives. So if this thing was falling and was collecting more and more things, it will keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger to a point that it will very rapidly sink. Because remember, the, the sinking rate was R square. So if this could somehow grow bigger, uh, that would be phenomenal. But then there are other processes that are at play that fracture and break it. And of course, the microbial activity is happening at the same time. And one of the things that we are excited about is to really be able to build technologies uh, that allow us to see this dynamic process, but at a microscopic scale. That's the difference because, you know, in the end, the things that I talked about were the average estimates of how much marine snow rainfall is at play. And then this is an approach of thinking about at a microscopic scale, what does that actually look like? And then just to give you guys a flavor of uh, how much... Uh, uh, both fun and challenging it is uh, to kind of work in this context. Uh, these are the instruments that make this possible. And at some point of time, I'll talk about these instruments for with the folks that are actually Ooh, interested. Like uh, 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 and the reason we can do this is essentially to create a little bit of a condition of what's happening in the ocean, but on a tabletop to really be able to measure these processes uh, simultaneously. And then I think just as a context of what it feels like to work in an oceanography vessel, this is one example. You're watching certain sets of things. Here are the sets of instruments that we build to essentially measure these fluxes. Uh, and you're always watching uh, on the screen. The weather is on display. And I kind of love this moment was a fun one. This is off the coast of Hawaii. Uh, the storm is there and we are here. We did have to shut down and turn around. Uh, I think eight hours after this, it was our night shift. So we collected whatever we could. And you can see we have so much equipment. We had to really hunker down and pack. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the framework of thinking about this, and this is what costs so much money, is safety. Because even though we are out at sea, it has to be a safe operation. And uh, being able to make measurements both at sea, but in also the context of uh, uh, the location where something like that is actually happening because all of these things are dynamic processes. So there is nothing that we can do in the lab that can recapitulate that process. And so we do have to get the lab out to the field. But then on the other hand, uh, there is a large number of measurements that we should really be making. Uh, in these sets of instruments. So, and we've written quite a lot about this instrument. So if people that get interested in carbon sequestration, I'll kind of have a very dedicated uh, demo and much more of a dedicated deep dive into thinking about sequestration. Uh, we're also using this tool to measure the efficacy of carbon sequestration technologies now, because there are lots of claims right now on people saying, oh, uh, this set of a technology can do this, but there are no direct uh, and quantitative measures uh, to validate those claims. So that's really kind of the uh, structure around uh, why this set of a tool. Uh, okay, I think we're probably out of time. We'll pick up the ocean another time a little bit later to first get a case study on a few sets of these tools itself. Uh, I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'll turn this into kind of a open mic for a few minutes. Anybody who has any questions, uh, otherwise we'll catch up. Uh, I think one thread that would be valuable just before I pass the mic to anybody else who might wanna ask questions and share is uh, uh, try filling out uh, the Discord for at least uh, which branch you might actually be interested in for projects because then we can have more dedicated conversations very specifically, and uh, that way people can keep track of their sets of interests. Uh, and then the other one would be is uh, please do try to do the uh, 
uh, the back of the envelope because you might realize that it's one thing to think about it and it's another thing to actually do it. Uh, okay, any questions, open comments, threads? Um, yes. Two quick questions. Yeah. One for the samples we took on Friday. Yes. How do you, how do you guys like keep the animals <laughs> alive? Like away from the yeah, so that's a big puzzle we can talk about for folks that think about the biodiversity. The answer is you can't. Uh, that's the short answer. Uh, there might be something in there that is possible to culture, and that's why the urgency sampling and data collection has to be right next to each other. The longer we wait, we are already biased now because something that was not surviving in that small ecosystem will start dying off. Uh, and this is also why plankton scopes, we take them out to the field. And so the idea is to not collect the sample and come back, but collect all the baseline data there. We do keep them in incubators with light and other things. Yeah. And another thing to add is that even if you can keep them alive, like we've seen in our experiments, that if you have the same exact organism in a lot of places, yeah. the culture, their behavior changes mm -hmm. because their conditions are different. Like the environment, the chemicals in the water are different. Like if you're making an evolution to keep them, it's probably not going to be the same. They grow differently, they behave differently. And again, the there is a historic 200 years of all these media and we can try all of them. Uh, I think if anybody is interested in antibiotics, this is a huge deal right now, is to be able to culture unculturable bacteria because they can then be sources for antibiotics. But currently our culturing techniques are too labor intensive to begin with. And so I think yeah, that's a big gap right now. And the other question was, so, yeah. so how, did, how did you guys end up tracking the thing? The, oh, it's, the, yeah, it's for another time. I think okay. it's going to take some time, but it's essentially an instrument that simulates the conditions of the ocean. Uh, and that's how we can essentially uh, fall with the particles themselves. Yeah, yeah. But I think I'll bring you guys, for the ocean group, I'll bring you guys into the lab so you guys can kind of see a little bit uh, on the detailed context. You know, it's a, it's a published instrument that we've just built. But the point about this is, what is the intermediate? There is often an urgency of like, oh, let's throw all the instrument to be underwater. That adds a huge amount of cost because suddenly your instrument that you made to be super delicate on a table has to be waterproof and weatherproof in all kinds of ways. And then there is the other spectrum, which is, oh, let's just do everything in the lab and never step out. And this approach is somewhere in the middle. Like you do have to step out, but it is on the deck of the ship where you're making the measurements. And that's why we can reduce costs. Like anything that goes underwater, all the camera, the pressure ceilings and everything, you end up, you know, you very quickly start rising costs. Yeah. Um, okay, I think uh, it's already 10, uh, unless anybody had a burning question online. I looked at the chats, I'll just save, uh, some of the GPT chats, uh, the chats on the, on the, not the GPT chat, the chat text, I'll save that so that we can then copy that in uh, Discord. Uh, so to be continued, uh, and I think one of the things would be is, uh, please try to do the calculations uh, and post them on Discord. So I think maybe Thursday or something, I'll try start reading all of them and give you guys feedback. If you do a serious job at your calculation, then I think it is worth uh, the TAs and our times to really review it and give you feedback. Uh, but so I think, yeah, the challenge is just make sure that you actually do pick up a problem at this time uh, and try to calculate as much as you can. Uh, okay, I'll say bye uh, and we'll catch you this Thursday.